topic session st started. Um, just a reminder that if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A section. Um, the chat section, we cannot see. So if you have questions, put them in there. Um, I'm Tracy Arnold and I will be watching um, the, the questions and then at the end, we will try to have some time um, to answer them. If not, Gina will get back to you. Um, with that, I would like to introduce Gina LaLiberty and she will be presenting on harmful cyanobacterial blooms in Wisconsin waters. All right, well, uh, thank you for joining us uh, this morning to learn more about harmful cyanobacteria, excuse me, harmful cyanobacterial blooms. So I wanna start first with uh, introducing some of the terms I'm gonna be using. So when I talk about cyanobacteria, that's the same thing as blue-green algae. Cyanobacteria is just a, a more scientific term for it. Um, and when I talk about planktonic cyanobacteria, those are cyanobacteria that grow floating in the water. Usually they're concentrated towards the, the surface of a lake, but they can actually grow throughout the water column. And um, one thing to recognize about cyanobacteria is that they're in all water bodies in at least some small numbers. And one of the best things that you can do to protect yourself and your family from some of the harmful effects of cyanobacteria is to learn to recognize them. So I'm gonna to try to help you, give you some, some pointers on how to do that. So if you're looking at lake water like this, this is a close up, how can you tell if you're seeing planktonic cyanobacteria? And what you do is you look for these little tiny green specks in the water or sort of a, a green dust on the surface of the water. And that's gonna be cyanobacteria, otherwise known as, as blue-green algae. Um, they tend to be sort of this, this mint green color when they're actively growing. There are other things that you can do to uh, get a little bit better idea if you're seeing cyanobacteria, that's doing something called the JAR test. And the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has a, little has a nice document on this. You can just search for the terms Minnesota JAR test uh, to find that. So if you, let's say you've got some green lake water, some small particles in it, put it in a jar, cap it, shake it up, and just let it sit for a while, like maybe about an hour. And planktonic cyanobacteria to float and form a scum on the surface like you see here. Um, this lake doesn't have a lot so there's a really thin layer but if you've got really green water you might have a really thick layer with a lot of them in there. True algae tend to sink to the bottom of that jar and um, I want to want to let you know that if you need some of these links that I'm providing in, uh, in this presentation, feel free to email me or contact me through the, the conference platform. So that's the jar test. Um, but you do have to look closely at those, those green floating layers because there are some tiny plants that you might mistake for cyanobacteria. So again, here's that jar that I showed in the previous slide. Here's another jar with some green stuff floating. So what is that? And there are actually tiny little plants that you can kind of mistake sometimes too. So uh, you hit in this, this is the jar from the side. This is the jar from the top. And in this jar, there are some duckweeds. You can tell duckweeds because they've got this little root that hangs down. There are also a lot of a very tiny plant called wolfia, which is otherwise known as water meal. And wolfia plants are about the size of half the size of a sesame seed, so really tiny. And they tend to have this very um, regular oval outline and they're sort of grainy if you rub them between your fingers. So you do have to look closely and sometimes you're, you're gonna get a mix. You could possibly have some cyanobacteria mixed in here too, but that tends to be a lot smaller and finer than duckweed and wolfia. Sometimes you'll have floating green mats on a lake, and how can you tell if those are cyanobacteria or not? You can use what's called the stick test, which is also in that Minnesota Pollution Control Agency document. So if you put a stick into the green stuff and it comes out looking like it's covered with paint, that's probably going to be a cyanobacteria. However, if you put the, the stick in and it looks like you've got some long green hair-like material hanging off, like you see here, hanging off some tweezers or this really long green hair-like stuff hanging off this rake, that's gonna be filamentous green algae, which really are not hazardous. 
However, there is one exception. You do need to look at the color. Um, for the most part, cyan bacteria are really small. This one, however, microsyra can be several inches long. So you might mistake that for hair, but microsyra tends to look really dark, even black to the naked eye. Filamentous green algae is always gonna have this nice green color. So those are a couple of simple things that you can do to, to tell if you're seeing cyanobacteria or filamentous green algae or, or small uh, lake plants in, in a lake. So I'm gonna talk now about uh, what blooms are. Um, and these, these are what you really need to watch out for. Um, blooms are when you have cyanobacteria that are growing excessively to nuisance levels. Um, so cyanobacteria, some of them can make toxins that can make you sick if you swallow them in water, if you're inhaling them in water droplets, and some people will have skin irritation too. So these toxins are one of the reasons why we refer to uh, cyanobacterial blooms as harmful algal blooms. That's the harmful part of that term. Uh, there can be the other kinds of, of algae that are considered harmful algal blooms, but we're just going to talk about cyanobacteria right now. Um, but one important thing to remember about blooms, that there's not really an official quantification of them. There's, there's not a level that you reach that someone says, okay, that's a bloom or not. But I'm going to talk about some of the different uh, conditions that you might see that, that are blooms. So I'm going to start with the planktonic blooms. So again, planktonic cyanobacteria are those that are growing free floating in the water. And when they grow to those nuisance levels, you'll end up seeing really green water in lakes. This is filled with just trillions of those tiny little particles. One of the things you really want to watch out for are these pea soup conditions when you can see how thick and opaque that water looks from all of those cyanobacteria in it. These are just some, some lake plants and debris. But these are the conditions you really want to watch out for. Now, for the most part, uh, really large lake-wide blooms uh, or large blooms tend to occur in lakes that have really high nutrients because you have to have enough nutrients to fuel growth into that much biomass. Uh, during really calm conditions, since planktonic cyanobacteria float, you can have planktonic scums forming at the surface of a lake. And you'll notice in all of these pictures, you don't see any wave action. That's because those are really the, the really calm conditions that allow uh, scums to float to the surface and form. And uh, you can see a gradient from actively growing green cells here to cells starting to decompose, you're starting to see some sort of unusual colors and then this really vivid, these really vivid blooms over here on the right. And you start to see these unusual colors when cells break down and some of the pigments that are held within them are released into the water. I'm going to talk about uh, colors of blooms in a minute. So those are planktonic scums. You can also have blooms that are caused by wind driving cyanobacteria across the lake into a near shore zone at the, the, the downwind side of the lake. Um, so since cyanobacteria float, planktonic cyanobacteria float, wind can push them across the lake. So in this satellite photo, we have a highly enhanced uh, bloom in this image. We've got the wind blowing this direction across the lake. So you can see these pea soup type conditions at the downwind end of the lake and really clear conditions that are great, probably great for swimming in the upwind side. So you can have these really localized bloom conditions. You can get the wind-driven blooms even in lakes that have uh, really good water quality and low numbers of cyanobacteria if uh, you've got calm conditions that are followed by gentle winds over a couple of days that can drive even spare cyanobacteria towards one shore and you end up with just narrow bands of cyanobacteria. So uh, recognize that uh, um, you can have blooms at your shore in the upwind direction might have better conditions. Now these aren't technically planktonic cyanobacteria, but I've included them because they are some accumulations that you might see. Um, so there are some cyanobacteria that can grow as colonies or mats on the bottoms of lakes. So here are some colonies, here are different mats. And uh, especially in late summer, you can see these mats floating to the, the surface. And this tends to happen in lakes with really clear water because these start out 
growing on the bottom of lakes, they have to have clear water so sunlight reaches them and they can photosynthesize on the bottom. So some that look like this especially you see uh, frequently in late summer in northern Wisconsin lakes that are really clear. So I talked earlier about uh, blooms that can be many different colors. Uh, there are a number of pigments that cyanobacteria can contain that you can see when those blooms start to decompose. So here you see some sort of purplish and, and reddish blooms on the left, grading into various greens, whites, and turquoise in the middle, and sort of whitish and even, even brown on the right. So um, in general, if you see any really unusually colored water, especially if it's filled with a lot of little tiny particles. Be suspicious that that's cyanobacteria. And you, these, these, all of these pictures represent uh, really poor swimming conditions. These are, these are water conditions that you should avoid if you're, you're, you're intending to swim. So I, I've talked now about how to sort of identify a lot of these blooms. And um, now we're going to talk a little bit about what causes harmful algal blooms. So in general, in order to have that really high growth to bloom levels, cyanobacteria require a lot of excess nutrients in a lake to, to fertilize them and to support their, their growth to that level of biomass. So we primarily see the worst bloom problems in lakes with really high or high, really high nutrient levels. So lots of phosphorus and nitrogen. And when we tend to see blooms are when water is at its warmest in the summer. That's because cyanobacteria grow better at warmer water temperatures than other more desirable kinds of algae. Uh, we tend to see a lot of these scums forming when there's calm weather because calm conditions allows uh, the cyanobacterial cells to float to the surface. And in Wisconsin, we tend to see a lot of problems in shallow reservoirs and impoundments. Uh, they tend to be more vulnerable to blooms for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, they tend to be more shallow, so they warm up faster to those warmer water temperatures that cyanobacteria like. And also, if you put a dam on a river, slow down that flow, you can have a lot of sediments and associated nutrients dropping out. So you're, you're actually, actually, by impounding a, a river, you're um, creating a little pool of nutrients and calmer, calmer water that uh, can help foster the growth of blooms. However, in specific water bodies, uh, the exact causes of what causes a bloom can be really complex. Uh, there are a lot of things that come into play, such as the lake type and depth. Uh, if there are legacy nutrients from uh, nutrient inputs even years ago, uh, what other species are in the bloom and other biological interactions, such as with zebra mussels. So uh, in general, a lot of nutrients will foster blooms, but the actual mechanics of, of, of bloom growth tend to be pretty complex. I also want to emphasize that blooms can grow in any water body. That's because there's always going to be at least some cyanobacteria in all water bodies. So that's why the high nutrient bodies tend to see more blooms. But even if a water body has really low nutrient levels, things like wind can help to drive blooms on occasion. So given that nutrients are the primary cause of blooms and support their growth to high levels, nutrient reduction efforts are what we, the tool that we have in Wisconsin to help prevent blooms. Um, when, when, once nutrients like phosphorus can get into a lake, it's really difficult to remove them and it can be really expensive to put different uh, remediation efforts in, into, uh, into action to remediate that water body. And it's not just DNR that works on that. DNR has to work with a lot of different agencies, groups, and agricultural producers to implement different nutrient uh, reduction efforts, such as point source regulation and uh, non-point best management practices, or BMPs. Um, it's important to remember that nutrient reduction, reduction efforts aren't a quick, quick fix and it takes time to produce results. So it's really important to keep nutrients out of water bodies. So given that there are things that you as individuals can do to help, uh, I would suggest checking out healthylakeswi.com. That's the Healthy Lakes Wisconsin page, especially if you are a lake homeowner. Um, 
and uh, that has a lot of different uh, practices that you can use to decrease runoff from your property that also have some great side of side benefits for you, such as improving wildlife habitat and privacy on your property. Um, if you joined the septic tank talk yesterday, you know how important it is to inspect and maintain your septic systems on a lake. You don't want to be the source of nutrients to a lake. It's also really important to manage aquatic plants responsibly. Both plants and cyanobacteria take up nutrients, so it's important to allow a healthy aquatic plant community to compete for those nutrients and um, take away those nutrients from cyanobacteria. It's also important to spread, prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species, especially zebra mussels. Uh, there's been work in the past 15 years out of Michigan State University that shows that uh, zebra mussels in lakes, even those with low to moderate nutrient levels can help to promote cyanobacterial blooms. And if you're in a more urban setting, it's important to always keep leaves and yard waste out of streets. If they enter a, a lake through storm sewers, then they act as a nutrient source. Um, now, you've been probably hearing a lot about climate change effects on Wisconsin's lakes and rivers uh, since yesterday in this conference. And unfortunately, climate change is complicating the efforts that we have in place for harmful algal bloom prevention. So these two figures are from the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts. And they show changes that we've seen in average annual temperature and average annu annual precipitation from 1950 to through 2018. And and the asterisks in each of these regions note, note uh, significant trends. So Wisconsin from 1950 to 2018 has becoming warmer throughout the state and much of the state is getting more precipitation as well. So these are two things that are going to lead possibly to more cyanobacterial blooms in the future. Uh, additionally, regarding precipitation, this figure from the U.S. Global Change Research Program shows that the Great Lakes states are seeing a 42% increase in 1986 through 2016 from uh, the previous 80 or so years in these really heavy precipitation events. So one, two, three inches of rain at a time. And those, those heavy precipitation events can promote cyanobacterial blooms by bringing in a lot more runoff and a lot more associated nutrients into aquatic systems. So this is, this is a big problem. We're also seeing shifts to shorter winter periods with ice on lakes, so longer growing seasons. This chart is the duration of ice, ice uh, duration on Lake Mendota. So Lake Mendota in Madison's having a definite downward trend, the number of days it's covered with ice in the winter and associated uh, longer growing season. So these longer growing seasons uh, allow cyanobacteria to really get a jump start in the spring after not completely dying out underneath the, the shorter ice, ice on period in the winter. So unfortunately, these trends that we have towards warmer water, more precipitation, shorter ice duration and longer growing seasons are possibly going to lead to more cyanobacterial blooms in the future, um, maybe some intensification of issues in some lakes and possibly uh, new problems in lakes that didn't previously have them. So given that um, cyanobacterial blooms uh, can be ha harmful and they can sometimes make toxins, how do public health agencies quantify risk? I do wanna point out that in Wisconsin, we're a home rule state. So public health agencies, if they're able to do cyanobacterial monitoring, um, they, it's public health agencies that have the authority to close beaches and issue health advisories. And uh, if they do, they would normally do them at public beaches. So the guidelines that they would use uh, include some US EPA recreational guidelines for two toxins, microcystin and cylindrospermopsin. Uh, these guidelines were issued a couple of years ago. Um, before that, we had some World Health Organization guidelines that were uh, developed in 1999. Um, one thing I wanna point out, there's a difference between these. The EPA's recreational guidelines were developed to be protective of children. These older WHO guidelines were protective of adults. Uh, the WHO did develop did figure out that these high to very high risk situations 
were roughly equivalent to uh, cell densities that would mean that an adult wading into knee deep water would not be able to see her feet. So this is high to very high risk for, for adults. Um, so that's, that's sort of a, a little benchmark that you can use. However, I do want to point out that uh, last week, the WHO released uh, an update uh, to this 1999 work. Uh, they developed recreational values for four different types of cyanobacterial toxins. Um, I just downloaded, it's open access. I just downloaded this on Friday afternoon and I decided to not read about cyanobacteria all weekend. So I don't have any updates on, on these particular levels, but uh, health agencies can use different uh, recreational advisory levels for toxins. Um, but unfortunately in Wisconsin, not many health agencies have the capacity to do a lot of beach testing. So, Given that, how can you protect yourself? Well, the, the good thing about cyanobacterial blooms is that you can see the blooms that are of highest concern. So anytime you've got surface scums present, this pea soup type water, that indicates really high cell densities. And if that particular bloom is making toxins, then it could potentially indicate high toxin levels. Uh, it's more of a judgment call if you've got these floating mats at the surface or a uh, lower levels with sort of a fine dust on the surface. But in general, it's important to remember that water's never 100% safe. Uh, there's always other bacteria or viruses or parasites that could be present that could make you sick if you were to swallow that water. Um, some conditions that you really wanna watch out for that aren't good for swimming for people or for dogs include sort of shallow, warm and stagnant uh, systems. Um, Sometimes there are blue-green algae mats that grow on the bottom. They can be dislodged. And we did. We have had a few uh, serious dog illnesses in the past where dogs were wading in these areas, drank some of the water, and became uh, seriously ill from, from accidentally ingesting some of these mats that came up off the bottom. Other things you want to look out for are just a lot of organic stuff in the water. So here you have some decomposing filamentous green algae. Um, on the, the surface of this lake, a lot of plant material. Anytime you've got a lot of sort of organic material in the water, you can high, have high bacteria levels, or you could possibly have pockets of cyanobacteria trapped in there. So that's, that's not great for swimming either. So uh, in general, the things that you can do to stay safe and keep your family safe are just to use common sense. Uh, don't swim or boat through blue-green algal scums and pea soup water. You can use that sort of knee deep test as a check. If you can't see your feet, you need to choose a better place to swim. And it's always important to choose the clearest water possible for small children and pets. Um, really avoid letting them swim in shallow, warm, stagnant water bodies. There could be things other than cyanobacteria as well that could make them sick. Uh, always wash off after you're swimming in any lake, pond, or river, and always try to avoid swallowing water no matter how clean it looks. Uh, do that especially after rainstorms be, because there can be higher bacteria levels in, in lakes for several days after heavy rainstorms. Now I get a lot of questions about dogs. So what conditions are the safest for dogs to swim in? And again, you need to choose the clearest water possible for them, avoid those stagnant areas, avoid areas with a lot of organic stuff in the water. And just as a gut check, if you don't want that, water, that lake water in your mouth, your dog shouldn't be drinking that lake water either. Um, you really need to find a better place for your dog to swim. So here we've got some different conditions, really clear water, not a lot of stuff on the bottom. Those are okay for dogs to swim in. Here it's a, a little bit iffier. You can see that the water is a bit greener. There's some small green particles in that water, but she's got some a lot of nice clean water on shore so she doesn't have to resort to drinking lake water. And here, Clover is staying out of this water. She can see how green this is. There's actually some cyanobacterial material on the shore. So she's gonna go somewhere else to swim. And it's really important to keep your pets safe. Um, water intoxication from ingesting too much water and heat stroke from overheating share symptoms with cyanotoxin poisoning. And we've had uh, several deaths in Wisconsin that were initially attributed to cyanobacteria intoxication uh, that veterinarians later determined were from water intoxication and heat stroke. So make sure you give, give your dog frequent 
excuse me, frequent breaks from playing in water. Uh, if they're retrieving, give them flat objects so they're not getting as much water in their mouth as they're swimming. And uh, provide access to shade and clean drinking water always. They need to drink something other than, than lake water. And one other thing to keep in mind, if you live on a lake and your dogs or your cats eat grass, uh, don't use lake water to irrigate your lawn during a bloom. You're essentially bringing that bloom up out of the lake and depositing the bloom material and possibly cyanotoxins on your lawn. And you don't want your, your pets to eat that. So if you want more information about blue-green algae, uh, please check out the DNR's website. We have a report of bloom uh, link that links you to DNR Habs at wisconsin.gov. Um, I also want to point out one other resource that's uh, coming up. Um, I've been working with the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council's Harmful Cyanobacterial Bloom Team for the last couple of years. Uh, this is a state-led group that includes uh, a number of um, health agency and natural resource agency uh, professionals from, from states across the nation. And we've been working to put together a guidance document that covers uh, recommendations for monitoring, communication response and nutrient reduction for cyanobacterial blooms, as well as uh, reviewing a lot of in-lake management strategies. So this document will be available later this month and there'll be free online training in April, and, which will also be um, recorded and archived for on-demand viewing. And there's more, to, more information at itrcweb.org. So um, please contact me at this email if you've got any questions or you want uh, um, information about some of the links I provided and I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, Gina, perfect time. And that was a great presentation. We do have time for one question. Um, and it looks like the question that's in the lead can you elaborate on how invasive species can fuel cyan cyanobacteria growth? Sure. Um, this was uh, some work that came out of Michigan State University. Um, they focused on zebra mussels. So zebra mussels are filter feeders. They, they take in algae and cyanobacteria from the water. Um, however, they can be very selective. They can keep the, the, al the good algae that they want to eat in, in their bodies and ingest them, they can actually spit out cyanobacteria. They just kind of go and then spew them out of their siphons. Um, however, if you remember, since uh, planktonic cyanobacteria can float, they don't just sit on the bottom of the lake and die after the zebra mussels spit them out. They're able to float to the surface. So essentially zebra mussels take the good algae out of the water column and they spit the bad algae, bad, bad algae out and then the bad algae start to, the cyanobacteria start to uh, dominate in those systems. Perfect. Thank you. There are a couple different questions in um, the Q&A section. If you do have those questions, there's a lot of good ones in there. Please reach out to um, Gina and she will have more time to be able to answer those. But as I think we're good right now with this session, we'll get ready for the next one. But thank you, Gina. That was a fantastic presentation. And you're right, you packed a lot of stuff into that one. <laughs> <laughs> Go back and review the archives if you need to. <laughs> Thank Perfect. you. Thank you.